glad to see everyone collect back again this afternoon in this relatively peaceful oasis at the pavilion compared to the mood across the street or around the block or around three streets uh, at the MSC. So thank you very much for being here. Um, again, this is a foundation of the BMW Foundation's way of getting us to break out of our silos, try to think a little bit differently about the issues we're all very familiar with. I'm delighted to welcome uh, you as a group of 33 Futurity Fellows. Uh, for those of you who are here who don't know what the Fellows Program is, this is an initiative uh, of the BMW Foundation, Foundation is specially designed for the 2022 Munich Security Conference. And as Ilse mentioned yesterday, it's going to be a highly interactive approach uh, to addressing the most pressing sustainability issues affecting our geopolitical agenda. That's the point, as I said, to break up our silos, to look at the interconnectivity between governance, the environment, science, business, and of course, at the end of it all, people are at the heart of our issues. My name is Maitri Sita Raman. I've been a journalist, a uh, former television presenter, um, a builder of leadership communities across the globe for about 20 years. And trust me when I say, when I say, when you say something and I say I've heard it, I've heard it a hundred times before. So I'm not cynical yet. I still have hope in my heart that we will make a difference. And I'm hopefully going to be a reasonably efficient guide to the conversations that we're going to have over the next two days or so. So thank you again very much for joining me. Uh, I'm going to be opening the floor up to questions from the very beginning. That's the point of the pavilion. Um, the one thing I will request is, I know you've had, all had a chance as fellows to get to know each other since yesterday, but not a lot of our panelists will know you. In case they don't, please introduce yourself, the organization you represent, just so they know what perspective you're bringing to the table. And in case we have guests from the MSU who are not part of the Fellows Program, they also know and are aware of where you're coming from. Those questions and comments, please keep them short. I'm kind of tough on the rules. Um, short and snappy, otherwise I will step in. Um, and don't be offended if I do, I will buy you a drink downstairs. Technically, it's on the MW Foundation, but I'll pretend to buy you a drink downstairs. Now that we've got the business out of the way um, of starting the afternoon sessions, uh, our first point of discussion, as we know, is about the value system and the transformation that we're seeing in our economies, in our governance processes, or so, so we're, we're told that we're seeing the transformation and values being central to it. Um, we're seeing it brought home in real time in the last two years or so of COVID. Uh, for those who are non-believers, even they're starting to look at supply chain issues, the economy, inflation, the energy crisis that we're currently in and saying, hang on a minute, how much of this has got to do with our, with our climate and all the changes that are happening in it. Uh, we, we talk, talk about sustainability, SDGs, uh, just and fair transitions. These are all buzzwords now that everyone throws about. What do they really mean uh, when it comes to governance and tying it together? Uh, and how do you measure it? Because that's the toughest bit. How do you calculate it? How do you measure it? And most importantly, how do you sell it to all of your stakeholders? If you don't sell it, it's not going to go anywhere. And how do you make it the most powerful tool in the, in the kit? I want to kick off this session first with a man who knows about the power of values and what sticking to them can cost, uh, but ultimately is redefining how boardrooms and businesses look at the value well, of values. So here's a recorded uh, keynote from Emmanuel Faber. He's the chair of the International Sustainability Standards Board, and of course we all know him as the former CEO and chairman of the board of Danone. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to apologize for not being able to participate in this uh, important panel that uh, has been convened about the transformative power of values. And I would like simply to also uh, say hello to a number of my colleagues uh, uh, on, uh, on this panel. Um, thank you for having me for a, a short uh, introduction of a few words about this topic. Obviously, uh, it's a very important conversation. Um, we have uh, built an economic and a financial system where it's quite obvious now that we do not value what truly counts. Um, climate is an obvious topic in terms of risks and a few opportunities. Biodiversity is an incredibly important topic, both on opportunities and on risks. 
And of course, the fundamental aspects of human capital, which I know a number of you are uh, so uh, heavily uh, involved in trying to, uh, to value. To value what counts, uh, there are several uh, changes that need to occur, and they are collective and systemic changes. The, first of all, um, you know, one day, I think we should hope that we will change accounting. The integration of uh, non-financial items in accounting is on its way in probably the long term. There is before that a change in the valuation of the parameters. An uh, initiative like uh, the uh, uh, impact weighted uh, accounting um, and what GSG and many others, VBA, are pursuing, I think, are showing the path towards putting a value outside of accounting on matters that do count. But the first of an obvious uh, baseline for this is to make sure that we have a proper disclosure and information for market participants to make informed decisions, investment decisions, capital allocation, cost of capital decisions on the basis of a broader set of parameters than today. And this is where the tremendously important topic of disclosures lies. Um, we need a reliable, comparable uh, baseline uh, of uh, disclosures, ways to dis pave the way for immediately thereafter other important uh, non-financial metrics to become standards and themselves start to move the dialogue and therefore the decisions of the market participants. Um, we hope to be uh, going for the exposure drafts of both uh, the uh, uh, general requirements and climate in now the next several weeks. Um, and we will update you. I would like to thank you again for having me. Um, wish you a very productive uh, discussion. And uh, I will be happy to update you uh, as soon as possible. Thank, thank you. All right. That message sets, sets it up quite, quite nicely. Um, so I'm going to invite this amazing lineup that, that we have to take this further. And remember, uh, make sure you're participating. I know you've been quite vocal through, through uh, yesterday and today, so I'm hoping that you don't let me down um, and get involved in the very, very beginning. So this lineup is fantastic. Christian Heller is the CEO of the Value Balancing Alliance, a cooperation of international companies, um, the big four auditing firms. Um, and he is also uh, working, of course, with BASF and adding value to that and, and the initiatives of sustainability there. Petra Justin Hoven, designated CEO at PwC Germany as of summer uh, 2022. So you've got a big job coming up uh, in not very long. Sandrine Dixon Clare, she is the co president of the Club of Rome since 2018. She's also the first female co president of the Club of Rome together with Manfila Ramfili. Uh, she, of course, is recognized as one of the most influential people in the low carbon economy. And Brad Smith is not last but not the least. He is Microsoft's president and vice chair, and he plays an, a, an important role in spearheading the company's work on critical issues involving the intersection of technology and society. And I know you you are a strong supporter of the dream of dreamers as well. Um, I tried this at the MSC opening lunch, and I'm hoping it goes a little bit better in this setting, maybe more imaginative in this particular setting. Um, I'm going to put it to all of you. Hypothetically, if you could design a transformation strategy that put values at the core of anything and everything you did or advised others to do, um, what would that entail? What would it look like? Um, and how do you make it the strongest tool in the kit? Who wants to go first? I know. Who's expecting that? <laughs> Imaginative answer. Who wants to go? Well, I'll just offer a couple of quick thoughts. I mean, how do you put values at the core of what a company does? Because that's obviously what I know. Um, the first thing I would say is it helps to have a very clear mission statement for a company that actually helps you answer difficult questions, especially difficult questions relating to values or ESG issues. 
you know, ours at, at Microsoft are, is all about you know, creating technology that empowers other people, specifically every person and organization on the planet, rather broad group, to achieve more. Um, and yeah, I find that oftentimes when questions arise, we are able to go back to the mission. Um, when, when we go to the ESG issues, especially in the S category, which I think is actually the hardest of the three to really you know, uh, evolve, uh, especially in a consistent and comprehensive way. You know, gee, what are we going to do if a country that everybody is talking about this week gets invaded? Most of the time, a company would run as far as it could. But you know, if, if our mission is to empower our customers, then a corollary to that is that we need to protect them. And so oftentimes you see a company like ours standing up and saying, not only have we identified cyber attacks against another country, but we'll name names, we'll call out the country that we concluded was responsible for it. And it all goes back to our mission statement. You know, we have to put our customers first. So, you know, to, to me, that's part of this. I then think, think you, know, you have to go farther and you have to start to delineate the areas of priority, the various values, and then you have to operationalize them. And you just work through it very sequentially. Um, but if you can keep going back to a North Star, it helps a lot. A North Star for Microsoft. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I, I would, would like, like to build on, on uh, what, what Brad just said. And um, so when, when we started, with our mission and vision, then we were going next to the values. And we asked our 240,000 people worldwide what, what, they, what they would propose as their values, which ones would they keep, which ones would be fit for the future. And the interesting bit of that was there was values. So we have identified five at the end of the day. They are working around the globe. And we, we realized that there are different values working in different cultures, territories in a different way, and we, we associate them with behaviors. And then it started, you know, working. So you have the mission, you have the values, and then you can take it from there. And that has a huge power because it comes, it comes from the people themselves. Yeah? So they were part of building it. And that was a huge power in itself. So in your, in your idea, um, it is going back to the people themselves and asking them to define the key values and then moving from there to create the North Star. Sandrine? Yeah, I want to build on that, and I want to bring in a very dear quote to me, and I would love to test anyone in this room and if they can tell me when it and who it's been said by. Mm -hmm. And it says, too much and for too long we seem to have surrendered personal excellence and community values and the mere accumulation of material things. And then it goes on to talk about the fact that our value system is purely dependent on GDP growth, and we don't place a value on what truly matters. Does anyone know who said that and when? Anybody? No? Bob Kennedy, 1968, University of Kansas. So my call is to put values on overdrive. And the Band-Aid approach that we've seen Yes, companies are starting to move in the right direction. Yes, we've got the B Corps, and we've got so many others that are saying the right thing. I grew up in Palo Alto. If anybody's been to San Francisco recently, you can see what technology companies and the extreme wealth of a few has done to the poverty of so many. So for me, going back to that mission and vision is to bring values back to what is most essential to tap into the consciousness post-COVID of most of us. Did we feel that the ownership of more material things was going to save us from a severe pandemic? That it was going to save our kids, our families? No. Did we feel that actually our governments were doing enough to protect us for the future? Coming back to the invasion, do we feel that actually the European Union and working directly with policymakers put in place the right infrastructure to shift away from our dependency on Russian gas, which is creating the tension around the invasion? No. So, my call to everyone and to corporate leaders and to leaders in general, because we're all people, is to put values on steroids to understand what values truly mean. That means the evaluation across the economy, not just in the corporate value system. And that means new indicators 
to growth or a different type of growth. And we have five key countries that are now moving in that direction that have adopted well-being indicators and bundled alongside GDP, environmental, social, and economic indicators, placing a value on education, placing a value on access to health care, placing a value on longevity and on long-term planning in order to enable resilience to the continuous shocks and stresses that we will have from the tipping points that are before us. So I think this is a very broad conversation that we absolutely need to embed in the way in which we engage with the economy, not just the way our corporations are changing themselves. Absolutely. Christian, I'm going to put it to you. So I think what we currently see is tremendous movement that companies, companies are rethinking that they are part of societies. And we will only be resilient as companies and create long-term value if we are embedded in the societies and the value systems. And these value systems are changing tremendously these days. For sure, we have regional differences, depending also on the development stages where we are in the different countries. But we see that also something like a global value system is now changing. So this is what you mentioned, Sandrine. It's about GDP plus, if you might say so. And we say it's the same development at the corporate level. We are redefining corporate success. This is all around what you said, Brett, the mission. It's about purpose in the end. And with the purpose, we are now indicating new KPIs like the Net Zero Movement. So the question is, how do we define corporate success? How do we account for that one? But how can we also incentivize corporates to move in this direction? And this is then linked again to the politicians, to the standard setters, to civil societies. So we need to have this broad dialogue and, co and collaboration to move in something what you could call a sustainable and inclusive economy. I think breaking out of silos, we'd really come back to that at the end of it. I know we have a question right in the front. Um, if you can just wait for question, comment. I have just a question. Marcello Palazzi, B Corp, Now Foundation and other organizations. Uh, here in Germany, this was the home of the social market economy. How many years ago? 60, 70, 80 years ago? Uh, so, in a way, Germany was an example of how you could create uh, an enterprise-based society, but a very strong community, a welfare-based society. So, we already have the origins, and other countries in Europe have it too. Uh, so, I want to make two specific points. One is uh, Faber and the accounting, we still account individually. So, a corporation accounts on its own, and it's fine that they should do that, but there should be a component of accounting also for your stakeholders, your ecosystem. So how, because that's operationalizing the values. I think for me the issue is more how do we operationalize the value than how the values themselves. So I want to say concretely, can we move towards a combination of yes accounting, yes measuring, but not only measuring my own entity, my own company, but my company plus yeah. the system that we affect, that we impact on. I think this will have huge repercussions. And you know, finally to say that there is a discussion going on about not double entry bookkeeping, but quadruple entry, also positive and negative externalities. How do we build them in? So it's really about, for me, maybe someone could comment, it's not so much the values, but it's how do we operationalize these values in very concrete ways that achieve this social market economy. That it's a valid point, Brad. Yeah. Uh, no, I think it's an excellent point because I think the truth is the operationalization of these values and the measurement of them in a standardized way is probably the most difficult thing of all. And it's the prerequisite to any real hope for progress, more generally. Um, when I look at ESG, you know, I agree with what Emmanuel was saying. We should have the opportunity to make the most progress the fastest in the E around the environmental issues. But even there, I'm just so struck by the difficult challenges we all need to work together to resolve. And we can, and I believe we will, but they're hard. I just think, take something as simple, simple, as the value of reducing carbon emissions. There's really a global consensus. We want to see less carbon emitted. So not only do you agree on the value, we agree on what should be measured, carbon, and we agree on the goal, it needs to go down. Now let's talk about the reality of doing that today. In the last two years, almost 2,000 companies globally have pledged something like net zero. It all involves some reduction in carbon. 
great, you'd think it should be easy. It's not. You know why it's not? Because, first of all, the standards that we have today are completely unsuitable for the future. It's all based on what's called spending-based accounting. In other words, if you buy concrete, you look up how much you spent, and then you look at a table, and then you report, on average, how much carbon is emitted for each ton or kilogram of concrete. Now let me tell you how it works in practice. You heard it earlier if you were part of the climate uh, conversation. Green concrete costs more than regular concrete. We want the world to buy green concrete. It emits less carbon. In Redmond, Washington, we're in the middle of a huge expansion of our campus. We're paying the green premium to get greener concrete and greener steel, but it costs more. You know what that means? We're spending more on concrete. That means that when we do our carbon emissions report, because we spent more to buy green concrete, the current standard in place says that we're emitting more carbon when in fact we're emitting less. That is just one example of hundreds of examples of how we need to re-engineer and fundamentally rewire just the standards in place in order to operationalize a goal that I think is universal and we can all agree on. Who does that, Sandri? Yeah. I know you wanted to come in on that. I did because I actually, now I'm going to come on the flip side of this because I, I fully agree. I mean, the fact is there are so many perversities in the regulatory structures that we have in place that are not enabling not only corporations, but I do want to remind everyone that here in Europe, 98% of our economy is dependent on SMEs, not large corporations. And, you know, there's this obsession with larger corporations who are fundamental across the world in terms of their footprint and their social contract. But we also have to remember that economic activities that are undertaken, at least in this region and many other regions, are dependent on small and medium-sized enterprises, that they also need to figure out how do they actually operationalize a potential net zero aim for them. And that is much more complicated. And that's where we need to localize also the regulation. Ensure, and we're seeing this more and more, communities and community leaders that are enabling through donut economics or other economic models, small and medium-sized enterprises to either get tax incentives or to get special green procurement benefits in order to not pay more for that cement. It's ridiculous that we are paying more. And it's ridiculous that the cost accounting is totally dysfunctional. So we do need to work on this. My last plea would be, this is the decade. This is the decisive decade. I have been working in this area for far too long, 35 years, with corporations for the last 35. And we started talking about sustainability and sustainable accounting 35 years ago, if not before. We can't continue to tinker. We have to figure out how we can put in place the radical partnerships to operationalize and really force policymakers to enable us to actually change, because that is part of the problem, is their lack of political will and short-term political cycles, which make them really for us, actually, in some ways, not enablers, but actually barriers to change. Hmm. Um, I know Christian wanted to come in, and then Petra. So I think you're totally right. We have really an issue with regard to accounting, and we have an issue with regard to incentive systems. So when we're talking about accounting and operationalization, there are companies like in my organization who are already starting to integrate sustainability aspects directly into financial accounting systems. And this needs to happen. And this is totally shifting also the perspective on value drivers. Because if you're looking as a non-accountant as I am, on for example the employee, why is the employee on the balance sheet just a cost driver? It should be an asset. So we need to totally rethink also value drivers. I want to come back to your intervention. We also need to look how, what value does an enterprise have, but what is the value an enterprise or a business model is creating for society? In the end, it's two perspectives, what the EU Commission calls outside in and inside out. And we need to have sound measurement systems for that to compare performance. But you're totally right, Sandrine. We also need to simplify all of these methodologies that are currently developed by the big corporates together with the academics 
simplified for small and medium-sized enterprises because we are part of the value chain and we will be part of the regulation. Mm -hmm. So we need to find solutions for these at the foremost. It has to be cost effective at the end of yeah. the day. So, yeah. yeah, Petra. So, as I happen to be an accountant, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> taking up what, what you've t uh, just said and, and also Christian, um, I mean, well, I really appreciate that uh, the European territories are taking it up and, and driving with that regulation. I think it's time to do that. Yeah. That's the one thing. The other thing is what you've just said we need to have a global aligned standard. Yeah. We also need to find a balance between sort of pragmatic and science-based, yeah? It should be doable. And if you just, I mean, think about a company, we're sitting in a foundation here, yeah? an automotive uh, um, um, producer, yeah? Then there is this, the whole supply chain, yeah? So if you want to have a metric which is sort of embedding the whole value chain, you need to go down the tiers until the small companies who are supplying that bigger ones. And then it's end, and then it's getting sort of the total view. So I think measurement works best when it sort of starts with embedding in the strategy, with embedding in the governance, with embedding in the operational systems, in the incentives, and then it's about reporting, and then it's about assuring the information. And there again, we need to make sure that we have quality in the information, and that's where you're coming from. We are still long time not there where we can have a comparable quality if you look at the financials and the non-financials, and there is a way to go also with systems. Yeah? So if you just think about assuring one KPI in a big company all over the world, yeah? there needs to be a methodology, an ERP system, a cloud system, a way to really gather that together. And that's what companies are just making up their minds right now as we speak. So I think it's speeding up, as you said, it's time to go there, but there is a way. And I think we need to shape that way in a doable, in a doable way and make sure, you know, once we've started with climate, just learn from what we've learned and take it then to social and they take it then to governance yeah, to make sure we're doing the right thing also on regulation. Yeah. And then do it with speed because, as Sandrine says, we don't have a, a lot of time. We have a question in the front. Question, comment. Well, I just want to echo Sandrine. I feel like I've seen this panel for like 15 years over and over. So maybe at some point someone can say, why are we stuck? Maybe we're not. Maybe this is a turning point. But really, why are we stuck? But my, my point is, if we measure what matters and values are important, clearly democracy is under threat. And should we be adding a D to the ESG now before we embed all these you know, updated standards? If democracy is a value for us and our societies, shouldn't we be measuring that? And shouldn't businesses be in the business of protecting democracy in some way, shape, or form with their customers who are also citizens? So should could, we have a D? Could we also get a bit of an introduction so they have an idea? If Sorry, I'm Lisa Woodard, the co-founder of Apolitical and the CEO of our foundation and a for charity fellow. Who wants? Yep, yeah, Sandrine. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Great question. Um, I would say that we have to define, if we're looking at democracy, what democracy means in democracy, because now many will say that large-scale corporations have taken over our democracies, so there's a bit of tension there, and I think we need to unpack what that really looks like. Um, I do think that we also need to understand that democracy is not short-term profits and short-term political cycles. Democracy needs to be founded on long-term planning. It needs to be based on embedded values around true environmental, social, and governance needs. We can see right now, and this is the hypocrisy of what we're doing right now on this lovely panel, is the European taxonomy, which was a science-based new criteria for what green looks like for the investment community, one-upping ESG, taking it to the next level, has just allowed for nuclear and gas. That decision was not a recommendation coming from the scientific, even investment panel that I sat on for two and a half years. That decision was taken by the German and the French government, the French government that is in a short-term political cycle and right now needs to make sure that Macron wins against potentially Le Pen and the new German government that did not want to take a risk just starting in the new government. That is the reality. So that is part of the barrier. How do we deal with that? 
Part of dealing with that is coming back to the dysfunctionality in our existing finance system, economic system, and political system. It is up for grabs, and I would say we as people need to start taking a step back and thinking, either we go straight to the wall, because we will have continuous crises, or we truly question ourselves as human beings and ask, do we get away from power, politics and profits into people, planet and prosperity and ensuring that truly we service those three, then we need to change our economy, change our finance system and change our political system. And yeah, it's a huge call, but I believe that the human spirit can do it. The question is, do we have the will? Well, it brings up a good point, and I know, Brad, you want to pick it up, I, but I, I'm going to add to that, that point because I keep saying I've been doing this round for 20-odd years, and I'm still not a cynic, um, but it's a valid point. Democracy the way we know it, Western democracy the way we know it, um, is inevitable that we're going to have short-term political cycles. We are going to have people who are not going to come along for the ride if their lights go out. I like quoting that just because it really stuck with me in Glasgow. Um, but at some point... We're going to keep going around in circles until the big companies set a trend, make it cheap enough, and make it easy enough for the smaller companies to have a strategy at play. Isn't that how it should work? Or is that how it should work, where we don't, we're not reliant on politics? I think there's sort of two really interesting aspects of your comment and question. And, you know, it has two branches, so I'll probably just pick one, but, but you know, I'd love to come back and talk about the democracy side. I think that's key. But let's, like, first talk with, about, you know, are we stuck? Why are we stuck? Where are we stuck? And, you know, I'll go back to environmental. We're getting unstuck for the first time, I believe. And why are we getting unstuck? I, I actually would differ a little bit from your comment Look, I think if you think you can have prosperity without profits, then you're sort of ignoring human nature. The profit motive is actually at the heart of everybody in all of the small and medium enterprises, the large ones. What you really want to do is get alignment between profits and prosperity and planet and everything else. And the reason we're getting unstuck, in my view, is that that is starting to happen. Why is it happening? Because it's happening at both ends of the economic spectrum. Investors who determine share price are saying they care about whether a company has a set of practices that are environmentally sustainable. And customers, even more important, are sending market signals that they care as well. Now, interestingly, for the profit motive and market signals to work, you don't need 100% of, of the customer universe to say they care about something. Someday somebody will figure out exactly what percent, but when I look around the world today, I say that basically almost everybody in Europe these days as a customer cares about whether a company's practices are environmentally sustainable. And you know, people under 30 in almost every country in the world say they care. That is very powerful. And when a market shifts, it moves a lot faster than governments can. And once a market moves, it's actually, I think, a force that is more sustainable than political will, for the reasons you said. You have these political cycles. One of the lessons, I think, from COVID is a government can get a population to live under constraints it doesn't like for about two years and then people have a lot of fatigue. It doesn't mean that people aren't fatigued by market movements, but they actually end up adapting to them. So the fact that the market has moved is of enormous consequence. But then the other thing that I think we too often miss is that we juxtapose public policy against the market instead of thinking about public policy that can enable the market momentum you want to sustain which is why I happen to believe that measurement is so important. If you want to sustain this market momentum towards a more sustainable future, get the, the standards right and then obligate companies to use them. 
and then get companies to drive that through their value chain through scope three targets and the like. So I just think if you can start to put these things together in some new ways, you can actually unblock a lot of what has been ailing us. But I think this move, I wouldn't be so pessimistic. I think we have now achieved a turning point because you see that the whole investor community is moving around the notion of impact investing. You see that corporates are really starting to integrate all this purpose thinking, but also totally new business opportunities and business models. Just take the example of circular economy. So there are really strict movements around. But we need to work together in the end, the investment community, the corporates, and it's all around measurement. And we need to agree on a measurement system. Otherwise, we can't bring in consistent data for the investors to allocate capital, what also Emmanuel said in his introduction. And I think here we need to have a strong collaboration between Europe, let's call Europe as a thought leader, but the enabling factor is in the end the financial market from the US. And this, we need to bring these two together. So there are attempts like in the G7 Impact Task Force introduced by the UK last year, but we need to build on this one where it's not staying on the discussion level, as you said, since 30 years. We need to get this operationalized and integrated. And there are corporates who are testing this. There are investors who are supporting this. And in the end, I would expect that in the next five to 10 years, we will have totally different sustainability measurement systems in place and a totally new accounting system which is enabling investors to reallocate capital around this whole notion of sustainability. It's moving really fast now, but it took too long. But unfortunately, until this point in time, too much behind the scenes. It's too much behind the scenes, but at some point, I think a lot of cynics would also ask, the, the, the definition of sustainability is also quite flexible. Mm. Um, it's interesting the way non-financial disclosures happen. And if you go back to the same institutional investors who are excited and talking up the sustainability game, they will turn around and say, hang on a minute, we then have to look at the companies that we invest in, look at the way the disclosures are done there, and then you go, you, it, the, pad, the flow of water just goes downhill at some point. And then you have a situation where investors turn around and turn to a company and say, wait a minute, you're focusing too much on ESG. We don't like it. We saw this with one of the largest consumer goods companies in the last couple of weeks. We saw this with Emmanuel. In fact, yeah. uh, well, I, I was trying, uh, well, he's <laughs> an obvious case, right? I mean, he's paid the highest price. So as a CEO, as a chair of the board who's pushing, um, and I'll say the company's name out loud, Unilever, just had to restructure and look at their entire sustainability plans because a, a minority shareholder did not like the direction of the company. How do you make then your value system where we're still working on disclosures, accountability standards, how do you not let people go backwards in time if we're still working it out and shareholders are going, hang on a minute, I didn't make enough money this year and you've been focusing too much on that side. How do you do it at PwC? I mean, you've got, a, you've got everyone and it's mother on your books. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, as PwC, yeah, so on one, on one uh, hand side, we are consulting companies on their way, yeah, just building the strategies in sort of the whole value chain. Yeah, on the other hand, as auditors, we are making sure that the KPIs they are reporting on the non-financials yeah, are transparent, consistent. So we have the challenge that the standards are being developed as we speak, that the standards are sort of not yet standardized, globally aligned all around the world. So we are part of the equation. Yeah? And I think that's exactly where we're looking for a way and we are bringing ourselves into the discussions. Yeah? So we are part of the value balancing alliance. We are supporting each other. So what we are seeing, and that's interesting because it's happening just on that panel, it's, as you were mentioning before, that's not one company alone. It's an ecosystem which moves forward. So we are playing our part in bringing professionalism in, bringing our insights in, helping companies to understand, helping align, discussing with the standard setters, being part of you know, pro bono activities and helping shape the discussion to that goal of globally aligned standards, being able to have something where we can measure in a standardized way and in a comparable way. So what we are seeing right now is that um, 
the investors asks are raising. So if I look at annual shareholders meetings, the number of questions the companies are receiving on non-financials has increased massively. Yeah. So if you look at board discussions, supervisory board discussions, there is a, a, a really big field of ESG discussions. So I see that really moving forward. And the, the piece of the measurement, I think that's we're working in a sustainable way. And I, I will say, look, at the end of the day, in my opinion, there's only one way for a business to succeed, and that's to do two things at the same time. You have to improve your financial performance, and you have to improve your ESG performance. And what we're quickly finding is, if you do well on ESG but do poor financially, people will not give you a whole lot of credit, and vice versa. So we all have to learn to do two things at once. And if you're a big company and you don't do both things at once, you'll probably have a change in your board or your CEO. If you're a small or medium-sized enterprise, you're frankly more likely to go out of business if you don't do well on the financial side. You don't have that same margin of error that a larger business has. But in both, we just have to do two things and at once. It's sort of reinforcing each other, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I just, I think this discussion is so important because it demonstrates the complexity of where we are and the difficulty because we've totally over-financialized the economy. As, as you so clearly said, it's all about profits. And I'm now going to come back to that very essential quote. How is it that we enabled our economy and our people to get so sucked in to the fact that it's all about profits? Because it's impossible to survive it, it, if it is all about profits, especially because it creates also that competitive edge. And at the end of the day, we are collectively now in one of the greatest existential risks that we've ever had. So how do we then, and I'm, I mean, again, I mean, I'm probably sounding incredibly radical. I sit on many boards as well, government as well as company boards. And so I understand the complexity because we're not focusing on the right things. The market was not financialized until the 80s. The way in which our economic activities were much more core to people's lives and livelihoods prior to the 80s meant that actually profits were not the only thing we were talking about. There was a greater thinking also around wealth distribution, because I actually think that we should be talking about wealth distribution and not just about profits. So we have to rethink, and that's difficult when we're trying to survive in a business. But I think there needs to be a much greater wake-up call. This is not just about financing change or tinking around the finance system, it's about changing the finance system, and it's about changing the economic system to come back to that real value base, which is putting people, planet, and prosperity at the core, and prosperity for more people than just the very few. So, Kristen, let me put it to you. Does that mean we need the, the Brad North Star idea and a board that is willing to stand up and say that profitability is good, but on equal par is our commitment to sustainability. So do you need a really strong board to back the plan, to back the transformation, which puts your values? So Half the time, it's the board that tends to fold. So I think the board is one key player in this one, but the board is also under pressure by certain stakeholders, you mentioned investors. But I think Santrine is totally right. We, we need to think about the assistant change with regard to our economic system, including the financial system. And what we have seen, yes, we are too much focused on profits, but profits will be core in a market economy. Mm. The question in the end is how do you get external effects into the equation and how do you think about welfare distribution in the end? And here, for sure, policymakers have a key role to play. But one of the other starting points is how do we measure externalities in a business model? And what is the information and the value of this information for investors? Because if you're measuring, for example, your external effects on climate, this is nothing else than a risk indicator. And if you get this, in the end, into a reporting system across the whole value chain, you have an indication if a value system or if a company business model is, in the end, at risk or is even already a stranded asset. Because at some point in time, as we see, 
CO2 emissions will be taxed and internalized on the balance sheet in the end. So we need to broaden our thinking around externalities and how we get this in into corporate measurement systems. I, I agree, and I think that this goes then much earlier than the 1980s. Mm. I'd say it goes back at least to the 1930s, if not the 1880s. Because I think what, at least I would argue, is you want a healthy market economy. You really cannot have a healthy market e economy unless it is driven by a profit opportunity and motive. And you need to recognize that an unregulated healthy market economy is actually not so healthy because it doesn't take into account the external externalities. And that is the role of government policy. And in part, it is regulation that is often industry-specific or product-specific or just topic-specific like health and safety in the workplace. Um, at times, you know, governments can use taxes to then impose onto businesses you know, something that will, in effect, turn a, into a financial cost, you know, something that relates to an externality. Um, and there are other approaches as well. And you know, it's why I just think if you go to a high enough level of generality, it's all about how you combine in any particular era you know, the mixture of profit and regulation. And then I think your point becomes quite relevant. Gee, you know, we're in a different place in 2022 from 1972 or 1932. You know, and, and, and that, I think, does get to a broad societal conversation and a broad public policy conversation, including around things like you know, distribution of income and wealth, as you mentioned. I think Frank had a question or a comment. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'd like to address it to, to Brett in terms of um, what has changed over the last couple of years. And one thing which, in my perspective, has changed is managing data. And that's where your company uh, is known for. Uh, when we are, we have been in contact with, due to our investments uh, with a lot of uh, large um, asset managers in the U.S., and they have their quant, uh, so um, not our quant, but the quantitative uh, uh, um, teams there. And what you see there, that beyond the, the balancing and reporting point, they grab a lot of data to get a good investment uh, um, picture of the different companies. So I was wondering, as you were referring to ESG, and saying that even the DS is missing. And if I remember, you bought LinkedIn, which is one of the most, uh, let's say, mm -hmm. uh, biggest social uh, media companies. Don't you think it's possible to measure that? I mean, if you have not a know-how, who should do it? I do think that um, at the end of the day, most things in life are measurable. If you can define the goal you want to pursue, because you can't measure something unless you decide what your goal is in the first place. And then you do it, you work hard enough, you know, to figure out how to make it quantitative and then you measure the right thing. And, you know, and then I think some of this intersection between, I'll call it, you know, profitability and prosperity and planet and people, you know, and, and democracy for that matter, you know, really does go to then in part, I think, what I would call the exercise of self-restraint by a company that is really focused on its broader social responsibility. You know, I think LinkedIn is an interesting example to me. I mean, you know, we've always been very comfortable with the way of running it as a, I would like to think, a more responsible social media network. Um, it is profitable. Is it as profitable as it could be if we sought to monetize every piece of data? Absolutely not. But we feel better about the business model we have for it. And I would argue that from a long-term, even shareholder perspective, what we have is more sustainable. And you know, there are many days when, going back, I think to your point, you do need to say, we're not going to try to make every last dollar or euro that we can. And then what you have to do is be very public, and I think principled, and then actually accountable and measurable in talking about what you're doing. And that attracts the kind of investor you want to hold back the strategy, I'm assuming. That's the thinking. 
Well, and that's another interesting point. Look, every large company always has to be thinking about what is its investor base. It is, is it a growth company? Is it a value company? Um, you know, and you always have to, at least at some level, understand that you can't be the everything to everybody company, at least not for very long. So you're right. And yet you have to, you know, in the world today, especially, you know, your point values are changing and you, know, you have to bring your investors with you, you have to bring your employees with you, and you have to bring your customers with you, which requires an ongoing dialogue about what you're doing, which of course always starts with, you have to know what you're doing. You have to be able to articulate what you're doing. You have to explain it, in our view, typically in a principled way, and, you know, and, and linking it back with long-term purpose and value is, I just think, critical. Sandra, you wanted to come in, and I know there's a question at the back. Yeah, just a, a few building points on this. I, I think the question of metrics is a really good one, and I think that trying to find the right measures is really what we're struggling with the most. I mean, you had brought up, actually, the science-based decision-making, and I gave the example of the taxonomy. Right now, we're <laughs> totally caught up on science-based targets for, in particular, biodiversity and nature-based solutions, and we're also struggling. Um, we look at the reform and recovery bills across Europe, and we've seen that normally there was supposed to be about 37% that was earmarked for the environment and climate change, and it was very difficult to come up with the proof points for many of these governments, and of course most of them brought forward projects that they'd already invested in or had been thinking about for a long time, and there was very little new. So I, I think that we need to really build a broader community of agreement around what do we talk about when we talk about science? Um, does science mean that you get all the right scientists and then all of a sudden you trash it and throw it out the window because a few politicians have decided that it doesn't really match their science? or corporations or whatever, in order for there to be any validity and credibility. And that's exactly what the investment community is saying. Stop with the greenwashing. What does ESG mean? What does green mean? Because we can't sort this out, and we've got all these different companies that are coming up with totally different metrics and governments, so there needs to be a pooled community, which I hope the ISSB under the leadership of Emmanuel will be able to do as well. You bring up a great point. We can continue that, but I want to get the question in as well. Do introduce yourself, though. Hi. Uh, my name is Ricardo. I'm a member of parliament in Portugal, and so I'm one of the policymakers to be blamed here uh, on many of the issues that you've been raising. And it, it is a challenge. I mean, following my career in medicine the last decade, I've either been in national or local politics, and this has always been a major issue. And I've come to the conclusion that local regulation or national regulation is not enough to fix the problem. If you look at the big corps, you see that um, many of them have been forced either by transforming corporate social responsibility into creating shared value within their profit-based business and, and trying to transform those values into their business model. And that has been pushing some in the, same, in the right direction. Uh, others, as we've seen, shareholders are, are putting pressure in an opposite direction. But then when we look at the SMEs, as Sandrine was mentioning, we, and that's what you feel really at the local level um, and compose most of our economy, where you have this balance. You need taxation to be able to fuel your, 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 your social response at the government level. So you want growth so that you can make a better life for all. Uh, but the thing is, we are asking and putting pressure on these small and middle-sized enterprises that are competing in a global environment. Mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, we're talking about values. Values is doing what is right. And what is right is not the same thing for everyone around the world. Mm. Yep. And so it goes down to metrics, as we were saying. And in my opinion, mm -hmm. but I'd like to hear uh, from you, um, since you know, we have these multiple levels of complexity, uh, do doesn't this mean that we need another type of response of putting out a fair play ground for everyone? For example, using the World Trade Organization. So the price of doing business means that you have to comply with a certain amount of metrics. I've known a lot of people in public companies that want to do more, but their shareholders won't let them. But mm -hmm. if the rules were to be clear on what is the, the playbook to do business in the world, 
then things could shift. And for small and medium-sized enterprises, working according to the rules would protect them yeah. from those coming from regions that are not willing to do so. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. That is my politest way I can say wrap it up because we need uh, we have about 30 minutes left. It's a very valid point. Um, I'm not going to go down the WTO road. That's just opening a whole new can of worms. But what can we do? I'm happy to go down the uh, Go down that road, <laughs> Andre. I mean, my very first bill that I wrote for the European Parliament was on creating the Trade and Environment Committee mm. for the WTO. It took four years. We finally got it. We now have a Trade and Environment Committee. What has the Environment Committee done? Very little. Um, and so I think that part of your question is, first of all, we need new governance because we don't have the right institutions for the challenges that we have. And again, that's huge, right? If we don't have at least some ways of tweaking the existing governance systems. But we also, I don't 100% agree with you in terms of an international level playing field. I actually think we need to look a little bit more at how we can enhance local production for local consumption, regional production for regional consumption. I was just on the UN Food System Summit Advisory Committee, and it is crazy that there were African countries that were telling me that it's not their responsibility to ensure access to food for their people, that actually the trade deficit in food in many of these countries is because they're exporting most of their food and they don't even feed their own. There is something totally wrong with that scenario. So I think, I'm not saying we stop trade. I'm saying, yes, you're right. Let's make sure that we put into trade the right value system that we're talking about, but that we stop just thinking that international trade is going to solve everything and that everybody needs to compete on the international level. Let's make sure that we build up our communities, that we build up our local systems, that we build up our regional systems, Latin American trade rather than Latin America to Europe or the United States. So I think we need to rethink. The last point is, to your point coming from Portugal, I sit on the board of EDP, and right now, EDP, who actually is one of the companies, utilities, that has totally transformed its business to pull out of coal, and any fossil energy is being crowded out by the new taxonomy regulations that are pushing for oil and gas. So here we have a perfect example in other businesses that are really trying to do the right thing, and then what happens? Once again, they get the rug pulled out from under them because it's not them that are trying to actually follow the right metrics. It's, again, the governments that are not doing the right thing. Again, it, it brings up a valid point of, Petra, do we need global standards? Do we need a new institution that will be able to bring people to the same page? Or do we give birth to yet another UN, another OECD, another another multilateral organization which becomes another whirlpool of discussions, debates, and maybe linguistic wins that we can all celebrate? Or do we need something like gap accounting that somehow seemed to translate across the world where everyone understood that's what was required, it was simple, and everyone took it on board and we have companies following protocol. Is there a way to simplify this from your, from your perspective? Going back to the original question, how do we simplify this to make it worth the while for SMEs in Portugal, SMEs in India, my, uh, my home country, um, or SMEs in Indonesia to be able to do it, as well as a Microsoft or an Apple or anyone else? So I, I think there are always trade-offs. Yeah? So we're talking about speed on the one hand side, and we're talking about alignment on the other one. So there might be a recipe saying, let's take what we have, let's take the best out of it, and let's align and go faster. Yeah. So I think there are a lot of initiatives trying you know, to bring those institutions together instead of building again something new, which I think would end up in the scenario you just described, and we are not winning at the end of the day. Yeah. So I would go for let's align, let's take the best, let's look after the SMEs, let's have sort of a balance between pragmatism and science-based and, and see and learn what works. Yeah? So go, go step by step and take the lessons of taxonomy, take the lessons of what we have today before we're taking it in the same way. But who takes yeah. the lead, Christian? Who takes the lead? 
Is it the so government? We'll, or is it the big companies? There will, there will be for sure not in one institution or one person who is taking the lead, for sure not. But what we see, yes, we see a consolidation ongoing of a few key organizations who are going to drive this. The IFS Foundation is one of the best examples now integrating the SASB guys, the um, CEP guys and others. So this is one of the key essences what we have. But I think we need to make ourselves clear we are in a transformational period. So I usually phrase this, you know, companies are used to talk English financial KPIs and GDP growth since many hundreds of years. And now, in a really short timeline, we need to add additional languages. We were just building the grammars and the vocabularies around this. So natural capital, social capital, human capital, and we need to integrate it in the end into business steering and incentivization. So we call this in my organization from, in the end, profit maximization to value optimization. Because this is all about balancing. And we will have trade-offs, what we see currently with the or direct mixture between, in the end, carbon and net zero targets and profit targets. So how do we manage and what is the best equation or the best balance? And then we also need to think the global level, and you're mentioning right the local level. And institutions like Microsoft or the other big IT institutions play a key role with regard to standardization. Where would we be without an SAP when we're talking about financial reporting? We need to ask this question as well. So it will be different institutions, but we need to cooperate. And I currently miss this strong collaboration because on a global level, we are missing the North Star you just mentioned. We have this for corporates, but on a global level, we are still missing the North Star. I think we, it's worth just reflecting that we live in a world where we have actually a lot of tools in the toolkit. You can regulate at either the local, the provincial, the national, or the international level. Uh, you have things that happen outside the world of regulation, especially in the area of, say, standardization. And you know, in the world today, I think that we're seeing more victories actually come from real multi-stakeholder initiatives that bring together, call it like-minded governments, businesses, and civil society, the, you know, the many NGOs in the world. And if you look at, you know, going back to say something like the protection of democracy, you know, I would look at you know, some things like the, the Paris call, or then you know, look at the change that Jacinda Ardern, in effect, drove through the Christchurch call in a matter of months. You know, changing the way the tech sector dealt with certain issues uh, around digital safety and violent extremism and the like. And you know, the, if, if you ask, well, what should we use? I think the answer is, frankly, always going to be it depends on what the issue is, where we are in the maturity cycle, um, and never in isolation. If you succeed at one level, it usually creates an opportunity for the next. Marcelo had another question, and then there's one from the side. So let's go with you, and then can I get a mic here, please? I mean, I, I have a comment on this framework question that Sandrine brought up in Portugal and the WTO and so please on. Do. And that is, you know, we have not really uh, had proper economic governance globally for a very long time. Partly we did have it. We, in a way, we have it in the EU to some extent, and in the EU, if you look at it globally, it's actually been very successful in doing that. But we need to be able to create a, a proper economic governance at the global level. And this is, uh, a lot of issues are involved in, in that, because for example, uh, think what happened you know, 30, 40 years ago where we started manufacturing in China, in India, and in all these countries, and now some countries uh, actually would have liked to retain the manufacturing capacity in their own country. So all this process, if you just also add the sustainability costs, you have a very different picture. You know, in other words, if you have proper economic governance that also accounts for the, the, the externalities, we have a very different picture. So I think there is really space for going further in having proper economic governance. The last thing I want to say is that, you know, Paul Pullman, some of you know, I've written about this, that most of the lobbying that goes on in the world is actually very self-interested lobby. I mean, I don't want to be romantic That's here, but what I'm going to say is that we don't really have a group of companies around the world that is lobbying for the wider good of society rather than for their own narrow interest. And you may have read two days ago in The Guardian, $1.8 trillion is still going to perverse subsidies, is still going to subsidize industries like agriculture and fossil fuel and so on. So we don't have proper economic governance globally. 
So I think there is a real space for going in that direction. Maybe ISSB is going to do some of that, but we need more of those organizations. Well, it's good to know. Um, one question there, and then we'll go there. Um, my name is Ali, <clears throat> and I run the Afro-German Academics Network, which is a network that focuses on enabling and empowering black and people of color. And in that quest, we also work with businesses to um, think about ways we can provide for um, for more black and people to color and call of color to get access to high paying jobs. And my question in this whole discussion, I'm somehow missing, um, we talk about um, businesses, we talk about policy, but we somehow don't talk about the civil society, the affected, right? And I think we should really be cautious to really include the affected communities of um, the whole ESG topic into this discussion. This is like where the one remark I'd like to make. Um, the second more direct and practical question to Mrs. Justenhofen is um, as PwC, as a, a, local, a global uh, a, a firm that focuses on the accounting practices, etc., where do you see the challenge of building a measurement system and operationalizing it um, into practice for when doing um, accounting mm -hmm. or at testing companies, because this is some sort of part of ev what every company globally has to do. So, thank you. I think I'm going to give it to Brad first, because you have to leave yeah. in the next five minutes. So and then Sandrine, and I, then Petra. I, I can say something, and you all can just disagree, and I'll, <laughs> I'll hear about it later. Just walk. But no, I, I think you raise a very valid point, and I, to me it connects back a bit with the question about democracy, as well as you know, what is the S in ESG? Um, because I think it's different for different industries to, to some degree. Um, you know, certainly for us, you know, we've taken on the mission statement I referred to earlier, and, and, and we have four pillars under it. You know, one is the protection of fundamental rights, which really goes to the heart of democracy, as well as, say, to the rights of people of color. We have another pillar that's about inclusive economic growth, which gets you know, very much at you know, some of the same aspects. The other two are about trust and, and environmental sustainability. And you know, what I would say is, um, you know, for those of us in, who have companies that are based in the United States, the Black Lives Matter movement, and especially the issues of 2020, were, were something of a watershed. Yeah, I think they led to awakening, or a reawakening, if you will, uh, of the need for companies to think much more deeply and broadly uh, about what we're doing to address these issues. You know, so certainly for us as a company, we created a racial equity initiative um, you know, the one thing I just feel is so important is that if, if a company is going to do anything that matters, and if it's going to be sustainable, it has to embrace a level of transparency that will lead to accountability. You know, so we d define goals for ourselves, you know, not just around our internal growth of, say, employees and promotions for black and African-American citizens in the United States, but to look broadly at our ecosystem, to look at what we're doing, to use data, you know, to you know, protect people's rights, including, if necessary, from the police. And we put out an annual report with very objective metrics, good, bad, or somewhere in between. And you know, I think one of the important questions we're working on ourselves is, how do we take what we're learning in the United States and take it around the world? because I, I, I'm sure that that's one of the things that your group focuses on. Um, and so, yeah, I, I do think it's just, I think an example of how, excuse me, the S needs to be better defined. We need to ask companies to aim higher, and we need to hold companies accountable, including to themselves, and there's only one way to do that. That's through ob objective metrics and transparency. But I know you and with that, I'll exit stage something. I, I was and about to give you an out, but yeah, you took did. it. That's great. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> now, since he's leaving, does anyone want to con uh, contradict him or debate him since he's not around to answer back? <laughs> well, actually, Brad, I'm not going to contradict you. Bye, though. <laughs> um, I, I'm just going to maybe add another element to the S. 
which is, and thank you for that question because I was going to get to it. As, as the Club of Rome, and as some of you may know, this is the 50th anniversary of the Limits to Growth. We're asking ourselves a lot of questions, like why the hell didn't people get it? We're 50 years later and we're still obsessed with growth. And I think part of that is because of the S. Part of that is clearly because of part of what we've been discussing, that that profit motive and that we immediately changed the notion of growth into the only thing that was driving economies. And so what we've decided to do is, for the 50th anniversary, come out with a new analysis called the Earth 4 model, which actually has turned sectors on, the, on its head and instead looked at equity, poverty, and empowerment as the three key reasons and turnarounds that we need to think about first in order to shift our economies, and then energy sector, food sector, manufacturing, et cetera. And as it's a system dynamic model, it will show us the integrated approaches and the type of new taxation structures, new governance models, et cetera, that we need to actually truly turn this great big shift that we need to have as soon as possible. And it's been fascinating because, and again, look at the color of a part from yourself, my dear. Uh, thank you. The I'm four of always us. Always the diversity factor. You do a great job. <laughs> All from the West. Yep. Most of the members of the Club of Rome originally were all from the West, white men above the age of 60. Now, we've changed that, but the reason I say that is because we're trying to understand what are economists from most of the world, which is the South, saying? What are people on the ground saying? How do they evaluate the S? Because that S is evaluated by a bunch of Western accountancy firms, sorry, and all of us who have decided to evaluate what the S means to us, not necessarily taking into consideration their needs. And just recently, yesterday, in discussions with Sheila Patel, who you may know, who is working on the ground in India, on so many projects, she said to me, Sandrine, can we please figure out a way to bridge the gap between all the incredible work that so many Western civil society organizations are doing and what's really happening on the ground and what my needs are and my people's needs are. Because if we don't get that right, we won't evolve and we won't really understand the true value system for most of the world, not just the West. Again, that becomes a question about where the value chain lies and what values really mean depending on where you are. I'm going to yeah. let you ans uh, answer his question on the, the difficulties, Petra. Yeah. And maybe just to comment on what Sandrine just said, I think there is a huge power and value in, in diversity and in diversity of, of in all the aspects. At the end of the day, diversity of mind, but the talent. Yeah? And if I'm looking at what companies are discussing today, it's not only what we've been discussing right now, thanks for your question. And they are also discussing about talent, scarcity, and how they can involve all the diverse talent in their companies. And so the transition they're going through, it's, it's not only on climate, on digital, it's also on people. And I think the, the bell has ringed and this, this movement is going on. So we as a accountancy firm also worldwide, yeah, so we have diversity inclusion on the top of our mind. And as we've been discussing before, it's a CEO topic, you know, it's how you walk the talk. And it's, there is partly symbolic, but it's also systematic. And systematic is measuring it and not, you know, doing hypothesis, but really going to data and showing where the problem sits and then going to action and driving it through business units and bringing those talents in. So it, it's a way, it's hard, yeah? But I think it's close, it's close to our heart, but it's also close to heart of many companies going that way because they have understood yeah, that talent is such a powerful resource and we are lacking it, yeah? So th thanks again for the question. I just wanted to comment on it. And just to follow up on his question of uh, the challenge itself, did you want to add anything to that? Wait for the mic. I just want to reiterate what you just said. Um, my organization is doing exactly that. And we have a beautiful project we did with Zalando. 
And um, Zalando was really open in that sense to say, okay, hey, how about we provide six internships for your organization for you to market them through your organization to, the, to your community? And we ended up receiving 132 applications for six internships. Zalando doubled them to 12. And this ended in the fact that 12 people from our community ended up doing a six-month internship with Zalando. We, out of two out of these 12 are now full-time employees, mm -hmm. and five are c continue the internship. So what I'm trying to say with this example is there is the opportunity for inclusiveness by design, right? And companies need to be open for it and to be um, innovative for it and not just say, okay, we can find talent or um, just blame it on different business units doing things. So that's why I just am very happy that you made this comment because I know it from a practical point of view. Thank you. And we can follow up right afterwards. <laughs> yeah, this conversation can keep going on, but I want to get two questions and we've only got about 10 minutes left. So uh, if I can give you the first question then have it for the last one. Yeah, I just wanted, uh, my name is Pedro Moracosta. I work with Climate Finance and uh, in the board of the VCM Integrity Council. But I um, what, what, just wanted to go back to the S, right? Part of the S is income distribution, is uh, reducing inequality and so on. And uh, Sandrine just mentioned the, the growth without limits that we ha we're seeing and so much concentration of wealth in, in, in very few companies. I mean, you have 10 companies that control kind of majority of, of food supplies. You have five technology companies now that Bradley has left that, that controls most of that. I mean, it's two yeah. obscene concentrations of, of, of wealth and power, and consequently difficult also to regulate. So the question is back to you guys. What do you guys think about that, and how can we, what can we do about that? Christian, you want to take that? can take this. Um, so first of all, I think we see already a shift moving. How are we defining growth? And we are shifting from this pure notion of quantitative growth to more qualitative growth. But this is also a little bit not fast enough running. Yeah? But I think there are mindset changes which are really being based on new value systems, making the bridge again to the topic of this uh, conversation. Um, is this fast enough? Most probably not. And the big question is again, what can governments do to interfere here that we have a broader spread of responsibilities and power by private actors? And from a citizen point of view, it's somehow strange if you see how, let's say, public responsibilities are, are going to be reduced day by day in the end. We have even now private firms who are running the wars for us on the world. And this is a really strange direction what we currently see. So here really the governments need to step in, but we also need to think about, uh, about a new paradigm of growth. And I think this is what you currently see with the whole notion of sustainability. I made the example of circular economy, for example. So this is moving, yeah? But we need to get the pushes in, but it's moving faster. Happen. I'm very happy that, uh, so Heba, BMW Foundation. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very happy, Sandrine, about the last point you brought in because it was like on the top of my list with even if we regulate a lot of things here, what's happening where the resources are coming, the south, the global south, this is like, I'm always asking myself and I think many in the room is like, why are, is it so difficult to do the right things? And it's very obvious what needs to be done, but it's just taking time and time and people's lives, etc. And on the one hand, there is the thing with the matrices and everything we're discussing, that there is a lot of change that needs to be happen, happening. Uh, and not in changing the matrices that exist, but actually create new ones, which is it like flipping uh, ahead. And this, it would be great if you have any positive examples, any ones where it flips as fast as it should flip. Um, and, and the second one, because we, you mentioned the customers and the, the values, like I, I still, I, I'm, I'm totally, I totally see, see the problem that mm -hmm. the definition of values on the customers and, and if it's a customer or a citizen or is it civil society, like this is so many hats that these customers are uh, wearing at the second and uh, at this moment and the values that the companies or governments have, like I think there is a lack of common sense. We have a problem that the, the societal needs or the S needs is very linked to the customer relationship to the company. If I, I take an example with MedTech, 
one of the biggest problems in medtech is that you're considering customers in the south that they are patients as customers so they don't get the healthcare they need because they are not profitable or investable customers so this is a definition of society and customer and this relationship which needs which needs clarification which is really a problem mm -hmm. out of my perspective so an example of somewhere where it flipped and what is the definition of a customer is is a citizen a customer a customer a citizen and where are they who wants to take that so i can Indeed. start on on where things have have flipped so i'm i mentioned the well-being governments and what's really interesting is and this is where i think that we actually now are getting very strong examples of how new indicators in the economy can actually enable human development and economic shifts. I'm not going to use the word growth because I don't think that we need to talk only about economic growth. We need to talk about, as I said, better distribution. That is those five well-being economies. And what's interesting is that during COVID, they were incredibly resilient. Another very important fact, they are run, four of them, by women. Another very important fact, from the very beginning, it was not about an ego power trip around COVID, around the dynamics linked to the pandemic, nor about the economy, and this is going to destroy our economy. It was about an honest conversation with customers, citizens, the youth, that this was painful for everyone. And so, maybe in one of the conclusions that we might want to make, this need to turn everything into a friggin' positive can be done through understanding that, yes, it's painful. What we've just been through is painful. Some of us have either lost a friend, a family member, or someone else to the pandemic. And if we continue to do the wrong things, it will only get worse. These women, in particular, mm -hmm. most of them younger leaders, were able to communicate that they were also suffering, but trying to put in place the right mechanisms to support people through these new indicators. On the local side, donut economic models, being transformed, circularity, regenerative economy, directly linked. At the European level, right now, I was just in a round table where we had 100 different economists that are working on trying to figure out the right indicators and trying to unpack what that actually means. We have so many possible avenues. Last key point, ESG. Even if I find ESG to be superficial, the fact of the matter is we know during COVID, ESG investments tripled. Why? Because actually the value chain was the most robust in ESG companies than any other company. Why? Because they took into consideration the full value chain and not just their profits. Petra? Yeah. We're so, going to make these into closing comments because we're yeah. running out of time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think another positive example is that we are sort of starting now with the financial community and that sort of the investors and the investing communities are influencing the real business. And that sort of systematic effect I've been seeing during the last 12, 18, 24 months, and that has a huge impact. So if those you know, financial communities and, and the, the real world are interacting with each other, with metrics, but with a, with a goal and a focus, then we have the impact and you see that. Uh, and that's, that's, I mean, just looking, you know, how many green bonds have been issued, you know, how, how that has been risen in a dynamic during the last two years, I think that's really positive. Yeah. Last word to you, Christian. So I think we see these turning points now really happening and there is exponential um, prosperity, not saying growth in certain areas. Um, sometimes I have the question, coming back to you, Sandrine, there might be too many initiatives going yes. on that we can't we connect everything. <laughs> so simplification might be yeah. one of the key Absolutely. aspects. And what we also need to work on, we are talking all the time now about challenges, challenges, challenges. I think we need to flip the narrative a little bit around. We are businesses. We should think about opportunities. 
And if you think about what we call challenges as opportunities like growth clusters, and we always call we are entrepreneurial and we want to have competition to be better than our peers. So this is about business opportunities and it should be a positive narrative to create value for all and not just for us as a company, taking new aspects into account, be it growth clusters, new accounting systems, new measurement systems, we should drive this forward. Can I add to Christian's point? I know you want to close. Is that okay? No, go for it. Yeah? They just get less time. Because I think you're right. And, and I just, the last, the last point I would make is that it's also a government opportunity. And it's an opportunity for all of us because all of us are incredibly privileged. But at the end of the day, we're also going through an incredible malaise. We have not talked about the anxiety growing in young people. We have not talked about the affordability gap that is only growing. We've not talked about the fact that we've got more unfortunately, burnouts and suicides than we've ever had, especially in the West. And so, although I agree with you, it can't be just about the challenges or doomsday. I think sometimes we have so over-romanticized the current economy, rather than looking at it straight on and saying, it's not working, people, at least not for more people. That doesn't mean that it won't work for us. It probably will make us a heck of a lot happier. And I think that needs to be the opportunity. The alternative future is positive. The current future right now, if we don't take care of looking at these challenges smack in the face, yep. will not be positive. Let me leave you with one thought, which uh, I walked away from Glasgow with, which was interesting. I was told by multiple heads of companies that the biggest worry that they had was if they did not transform the way they looked at their own value systems, they would not have a workforce in the future mm. because people were saying no. Mm. So if nothing else, to answer your question, Heber, maybe that's the answer. The customer is the employee of the future or the current employee, is the taxpayer, is the voter, it's the person, it's your boss. Yeah. Maybe. But round of applause to all of you for being so honest and frank thank about you. the challenges. And thank you all for not letting me down. We're going to go do what we normally do, uh, a little bit of a coffee break, and we'll meet back here half past the hour. <laughs>